thing. Let's see what it's going to be. So what are we talking about? Tell us the rundown. Uh, GM Strike, mm -hmm. FCA PSA, mm -hmm. Lexus and Infinity Turn 30. Oh, geez. I had sent you something, too. What was I um, I'll get thinking about? They're in very different places, aren't they? Um, <laughs> did, did you see how many places that that Butts' comment about the Model Y have shown up? No. I mean, I just keep getting these, these alerts. What did he say? The, no one will buy it. The, the so Model ugly. Y is so ugly. It's, you know, it's like... He's so, wrong, but okay. Um... No, but I mean, this, this has just been picked up everywhere, mm. and uh, it's, it's anything just, with Tesla will get picked up. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have to. It's so I, I do have I do have a lot of stuff about Tesla in here. So uh, mm -hmm. we we'll have to. Oh, we can talk about Tesla. Oh, I mean, they made a profit. Mixed precipitation yeah. possible at six fifteen. Oh, okay, I'll be home by then. <laughs> Only possible though. So. It was supposed to snow tonight. Of course, it only says here that it was a 50% chance of precipitation, and I think as we've noticed today, it's a little bit more yeah. than 50% yeah. chance. You know, we could talk about the fact that Ford's going to unveil its EV at L.A. Mm -hmm. Wow. 90% chance of snow tomorrow. It's must 90? Oh, no, it's tonight. Oh, wow. I, I thought see, so. See how this goes up? Yes. This, this, this part I up here. I read this four inches up, somewhere. This, this part up here is the snow part. I may want to start the snow blower tonight. But it says zero sure percent. I gotta get my winter tires on. Or zero inches. Michigan, the prepared state. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Know. I feel like I should have gotten them on a while ago, but. Yeah, I know I sent you something. Yeah, I can. Blanking out. I don't have it in the weather. I love the decor. Yeah, Carmen and Katie uh, decorated all this. Looks good. Nicely done. Yeah, what else, do you guys got any topics, Michelle? Mm, What's what hot? That's long, uh, trying to think what I've been focused on. Was there anything from the Tokyo Motor Show? Oh, the other thing is uh, Toyota GM uh, that was, FDA. That was the, that was siding with Trump. Trump. Yes, I was thinking of that on the way over. Yeah, there's something more to. I think it has something to do with tariffs with Toyota. Oh, interesting. Mm. That's my hunch. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Will you explain? That, that's a good one. Yeah. I, 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 once okay. we get into please, that, please, please, yes. please. No, I've got a couple of not theories, but data. Data points to talk about on that, too. Okay. I think there's some horse trading going on, maybe. Oh, I would bet. But we'll save it. This is mm. too good. That'd be funny if actual horses were involved. <laughs> Horsepower. Have you guys driven anything good lately? No, I have just been at my computer and traveling a bit. Anywhere good? I went on vacation. I did a couple of weeks in the Pacific oh, Northwest. Right. Really? That was nice. Great whale watching. Yeah. Is this the season? An is amazing this... hunt. No, it was not the season. No. So they were shocked. We saw the most amazing humpback whale that just came up out of the water and opened his mouth and. And he was, we circled him for like an hour. Wow. It was really cool. For the camera. Just did it for the camera. But even the guide on our boat said <clears> they have never seen that kind of display. Wow. So is this off of Washington or Oregon? Uh, or? Off of, uh, yeah, we were in Fri Friday Harbor, <clears throat> but the San Juan Islands, Puget Sound. We did everything by ferry boat. So that was kind really? of fun. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Went to, took the ferry boat from Seattle to uh, Friday Harbor, then Friday Harbor to Victoria. There are huge ferries up there. Oh, yeah, they're like, yeah, they're like. <laughs> yeah, huge. Yeah, it's like a taxi service. It's a city, you know, state kind of thing. So hmm. pretty cool. It was interesting to be there because climate change is at the forefront of everything because they're so sensitive to it. Yeah. 
Right. So did you get a lot of rain or no? Not a speck. Really? It was stunning because I, I, we were heading into the rainy season. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was beautiful. It's just the leaves were just starting to turn. And it was like 60 every day. Wow. Some sunshine. Mm -hmm. It was really nice. Sounds very nice. Yeah. Beautiful places. So when you say climate change is the front of every, I mean, everybody, people are just talking about it. They're talking about it. They're focused on the environment because mm -hmm. they, they're in it. They're yeah. living, they can see the, you know, the big, they're losing a lot of the whales because the Chinook salmon are gone. Mm -hmm. And some of that has to do with the dams and the snake and Columbia rivers. Right. But it's just the topic of, just, is they're so sensitive to it. So just regular people, not. Yeah, regular people. Just, you know, people you talk to, it's much more sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. That is. Also very liberal, you know, politically liberal places right. too. But right. yeah, It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to actually, what are they doing with their lives to change it? Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah a lot of people posting angry social media mm -hmm. posts and right. uh, they feel they've done their part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true, Groucho. <laughs> Jeez, we got all these things we want to talk about, but we've got to wait for the show to start. <laughs> or we're just going to have talked about it before the show. Oh, you, this is when you get a photo bomb. No, Katie, you couldn't even see that. You have to do it slow. Turn the light slower. on. Slow with the light on. There we go. What was that? They'll turn around so they can there see your you face. <laughs> well, you got that thing over your... <laughs> Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. And by DIA MTS for advanced manufacturing machinery and lightweight components. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Halloween on Arulan After Hours. Very high. It's amazing, a clown <laughs> vampire. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Yeah, so we're all sitting here. We've got costumes on. It's Halloween tonight. I just got my normal dress, my normal clothes on, though, the oh. normal Dr. Data clothes. <laughs> That's right. You do look, look like Dr. Data now. So, you know, so John Warniak, who always watches the show, he thinks I dress like this all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> My old neighbor, by the way. Your old neighbor. Mm -hmm. So we got to let uh, people know that we've got, I don't know, this is uh, the lead actor from There Will Be Blood or something like that. Or Guy Fox. Guy Fox mask. I just returned from Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> it's Lindsey Brook from SAE International uh, and SAE Engineering under that mask. Yes, yes. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at least we think it is. <laughs> yeah, at least we. And we got Michelle Karabs from Cox Automotive. And of course, I drive a stick. Yeah. So uh, just so you can see her shirt, there's a bridge on a, uh, a witch on a broom, and the shirt says, "Of course, I drive a stick." And I do. And, and do. she can drive yeah. a manual as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's great. So we got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about. Man, this industry in the last week. Holy moly, have yeah. things been going on. So the strike ended. The strike ended, finally. And it, and it lasted much longer, right? Longer than I thought, for sure. I heard, but I heard people speculate at the beginning it would be four to six weeks, and I said, oh, it couldn't possibly be. But I'm with you. I, I thought I, it would go two weeks max. Yeah, that's what max. I thought. That's what I was saying. But I was wrong. We were wrong. So why do you think it went so long? Oh, I think, well, I both, uh, yeah, the, the union had to, leadership had to prove to its members it was battling hard for them because of all the UAW leadership corruption. Um, and they are hard issues, you know, closing of plants and temp workers, and there are just a lot of difficult issues on the table. So who, who, who won? 
Did either side win all that much? I don't know. I think they both, you know, got what they needed. Not what they wanted, they got what they needed. What do you think, Lindsay? Well, GM still has the highest labor costs in North America, is that correct? So that was kind of a, you still have the highest labor costs. Yeah. Um, you know, the plan issue was a big one. Maybe there's some change in that right now. I don't know. They got to close the plants. Without got to, got to close the plants, right, right. They're still over, they still don't use, utilize their capacity they like don't. the best do, right? So what GM, you know, they had an analyst call where Mary Barra and the CFO, how do you say your first name? Don't ask me. Divya? 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 Okay, mm -hmm. so Divya, we're explaining, hey, here's how we're going to pay for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing this, that, and the other thing, and even though, uh, you know, the costs go up $100 million a year yep. in year one, by the end of uh, the contract, they'll have gone up $350 million a year, but they laid out, here's how we're going to offset all these costs, you know, we're, you know more flexibility in the plants, the, the ability to, to close plants. Uh, they are going to hire more temps, but what they, they didn't exactly lay it out, but here, here's what happens. Around 2,000 GM UAW workers retire every year. So those 2,000 retire, now they're going to spiff it to mm. try to get more to retire. So as those fully vested UAW mm -hmm. re workers retire, they then the in progression people mm -hmm. move up. And then the temps are a certain number, you know, 2,000 will move up on each side, right? But GM will hire more temps, new temps. But what about the capacity, overcapacity issue that you mentioned, Lindsay? What are they going to do regarding that? Well, that's a question. Another question for me is at the same time, Mary Barra mentioned that GM will be investing more in electrification and electric vehicle development than combustion engine vehicles. So here we are in 2020. The next contract is 2024. Would that be right? Yeah, well, we're actually in 2019. I know you live yeah, in the future, yeah. but right, right, right. So, so two more contracts. <laughs> right. So two more contracts this decade. My question is: is is organized labor attuned to this revolution in product development? Oh yes, they are. And and uh, robotization and artificial intelligence, et cetera. Is GM preparing the labor force? Is the UAW preparing them? German companies now are already training those who are in kind of traditional mechanical-based industries for the new, you know, the new generation. What's going to happen? Well, and I, I spoke to the UAW leadership uh, when GM had them all in and about the state of the industry, and I was really impressed with a lot of the they are asking those questions what about what happens to us with more automation what happens to us oh, with the rank and file is the rank, the, yeah, yeah. at least the local leaders local leaders yeah it was the local yeah, leaders I was that, that came in yeah that. yeah, that yeah that's right and, and um it was so they are very aware of it but i don't see any action plans on either side necessarily well you know look it's it's premature yet they're still not building any evs right right and uh the the uaw rank and file are very concerned especially those in powertrain. The rest of them, they know, hey, we're still gonna make bodies and paint them and all right. that, that's not right. gonna change. But the people in powertrain are hyper aware mm -hmm. that, you know, battery assembly is like 98% automated. Right. You know, they, and that scares the hell out of Well, and even yeah, vehicle assembly, when you're doing electric vehicles, it doesn't take as many people. I visited the Audi mm. e-tron plant in Belgium. Mm. Not many people there. Right. Highly automated. Highly automated. And when you just put the battery pack in the floor, there isn't I don't know. That See, because much. I went to uh, see the Jaguar I-Pace mm -hmm. and E-Pace built at Magna Steyr, and, and I, that's what I thought. Oh, there's got to be 10 to 15 percent, you know, productivity uh, savings with an EV. And they said, No, it's the same. I said, No, you, you don't understand. How many fewer stations are there? Because you don't have exhaust and you don't have uh, radiator. And they said, No, it's the wow. same number of stations. Uh, and they said. Uh, even though EVs don't have all those components that you just mentioned, they got other stuff that we got to do. So I don't know about Audi with the e-tron, but for example, putting in the battery pack for Jaguar, is, it's a two-step operation, two-station operation. Mm -hmm. And you've got to, you know, those big orange cables that got to be routed from the charger. So you add some other things that mm -hmm. you don't have to do. And, and by the way, uh, you know, when you put that battery pack up, man, there's a lot of bolts that hold that mm -hmm. thing in. It's you, not like putting in a gas tank. And, and, and it's got liquid cooling and there's other things to hook up. All, there all kinds of connectors, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. And to be fair to General Motors, they are building the bolts. I was just going to say, yes, let's, they let's, are. Let's, let's yeah. give credit where yeah. credit is due. So yeah, are, I'm just saying, here, here we are kind of beginning of this next decade that I think is going to have profound changes for 
propulsion, emissions, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And so how is the labor force getting this in their minds that there's going to be some change? Yes, they are. But I, you know, what, what's the next step of what do you do about it? Right. In terms of retraining. Them. Okay. This well, is who has, you can take the hat <laughs> off. Right, yeah. And who has the responsibility for that? Correct. Yeah. So, so, has the responsibility be... for training them? Yeah. Right. Well, hell, a GM does because it's got to hire workers to do the work. Yeah. But it's going to have to work hand in hand with GM. And, and we may as well get the... educational places, you know. Right. They're, they're... And you know, interestingly, we can get into the the you know the whole contract and strike. But one of the things that we've learned is the training centers are gone. Right. Gone because they were the root of all this corruption, right. evil that was going on. There was just too much money lying around. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. They're killing the training centers just as this need for retraining comes up. I'm sure they'll figure it out some other way, but they don't I'm need sure these. There's a more efficient economical way to do that. Oh, yeah. Training. You don't yeah. need the Taj Mahal exactly. on the Detroit River, you know, to, to train all exactly. these people. You got to do things locally right at mm -hmm. the plant. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's interesting. A week or so ago when I was at the Volkswagen Chattanooga plant, to your point, Lindsay, about you know, training for advanced technology. With the Germans in, in kind of leading. In, you know, and, yeah. and they have a, a big area that's dedicated to training with all of these new technologies. And they're saying, you know, we understand that our people are going to have to learn how to do this stuff. And then they're right. even bringing in kids from the local high schools mm -hmm. to learn this in anticipation of perhaps someday they may come work at the factory. Hmm. And, you know, so, so now is, is this because, you know, Volkswagen, and, you know, they get the one plant in the United States and they want to be a good corporate citizen given their past sins. I mean, is, is that something that they're doing? And other companies are just going to say, eh, we really don't need to do that. Um, or are we going to see more of that? I would and that is a non-union plant, Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, how much training do you need, really? I mean, you know, I, I, I saw the guys at Magna Steyr. Look out for the big orange cable. Yeah, I mean, there, there's some safety things that you got to be aware of, obviously, with that much voltage inside the car. But I don't think there's all that change in the skill that you have to have to assemble an electric car. Now, if you get into the engineering of it, absolutely. Okay. And uh, if you get into the assembly of the battery, you know, there, there is going to be a, a different skill set. But like I said, I'm told by the battery makers, because uh, the only battery plant I've been in was the, the old Nissan one down in Smyrna, mm -hmm. and that was highly, highly automated. Mm -hmm. But they never, they didn't show us a whole lot and uh, deliberately did not show us a whole lot. So, but I'm told when it comes to the actual assembly of the plant, it's 98% automated. Uh, of the pack. Of the pack. Of the pack, right. right. That's what I meant. Right, right. Thanks, right. Lindsay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, interesting. I mean, it's, again, 10 years is going to go by fast. It really is. So are you convinced that there'll be a significant number of fully electric vehicles within this period? I think there'll be, from the manufacturer, I don't know how many are going to be on the street. I think that the pipelines, you know, the new product pipelines are filled with them right, right. now between... 20 and 2025, we're going to see a lot of introductions, if you believe the forecasters and so forth. What's the poll going to be? That's the question for me. Right. Yeah. That is the question. I mean, you look at their plans, there are a lot of them. I was just looking at some of them this morning, but yeah. where's the yeah, demand? You, it, How do you, you drive at, demand? Yeah, yeah. Just look at the U.S. Almost half of all EV sales are just in California. Right. So the rest of the country isn't buying a lot of these things. Right. And, and Tesla's kind of leading. And so now we have competition for Tesla coming in, um, you know, vehicle configuration and price are going to be the drivers for this and convincing people that there will be enough charging, that their transformers on their local electrical poles aren't going to pop every time, you know, three neighbors plug their car in at the same time. I think there's a lot of issues. So yeah, but any, also, I don't think the U.S. is going to lead. We're going to lag. I, I, mean, I agree. It's going to be China and it's going to be Europe. I agree. Because yeah. They have to. Yeah, they have to, right. But I keep right. saying, who cares? Nobody makes money at this stuff. None. Who nope. cares exactly. if they lead in losing more money than anybody? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not too worried about it and from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't believe technologically the U.S. is going to back off no, in the development not at all. of this kind of technology. No, global automakers. Right. They have mm -hmm. to play. So, so I, I, you know, I don't, everybody's worried, oh, China's going to lead in this. Europe's going to lead. I'm like, so what? Yeah. I don't, I don't see that it's going to be a detriment to the U.S. Right. 
Well, the, this, this leadership thing in the U.S. versus the rest of the world leads to the other news we heard this week where General Motors, Toyota, and uh, a couple other uh, OEMs joined in with the uh, Trump administration's uh, approach to um, emissions versus California. Um, whereas earlier we saw that uh, Ford and Honda and BMW and Volkswagen, Volkswagen said they're right. going to be on the side. So what's going on, Michelle? Well, my hunch is horse trading because November is a big month for making some decisions about tariffs. And I know that is terrifying to certain terrifying. automakers. Terrifying. Terrifying <laughs> to, uh, uh, wasn't that punny? Um, to, uh, you know. Toyota. Toyota yeah. especially. Yeah. And so. Explain that. <laughs> well, um, there's the Trump administration is supposed to be making some decisions about do they uh, implement uh, tariffs on European imports, Japanese imports. On passenger cars. Passenger cars. And um, I, I know that's a number one topic for Toyota and, and the foreign automakers. And uh, I just have a feeling that maybe there was like, well, if you get on board with this, you know, we'll go easy on tariffs. I don't know that, but it just kind of suspicious to me, especially timing and. What's really bizarre to me is they've got to be placing bets right now for the 2020 election. I mean, you, you look at if, if any of the kind of far more left-wing candidates get in, you look at Chuck Schumer's recent plan, I mean, this is trillions of dollars. And this you know, is for electrification. Uh, for, yeah, yeah, government kind of, you know, pushed electrification and, and much more to come from that. So, so the, the automakers have got to be wondering, you know, who, who are we going to be behind? Who are our lobbyists going to have to be dealing with in another 18 months, mm -hmm. something like that? Yeah. Okay, so if we, take, if we take Ford and take General Motors, let's take the foreign manufacturers out of this, or the non-domestic is probably more appropriate thing mm -hmm. to say, right? So one goes with California and one goes with Washington. Well, what, and, the, and the GM one is intriguing to me, too, because they, they are boasting how they're going to be the no-emissions uh, manufacturer. Hmm. Now, everybody wants a single standard, which is what they're all arguing. Oh, we just want one standard. They all want that. Yeah. But... Um, that is an interesting one. FCA, I totally get it. They're, you know, they're behind. But, yeah. you know, the, the thing with, with, you know, it's an excellent point about the uh, General Motors, you know, mm -hmm. zero emissions, zero accidents. Yes, zero, 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 zero thing. Yeah. Congestion. Is that Can, it? Congestion, that accidents, and emissions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not the zero, zero, zero that Mitsubishi had a few years ago yeah. mm -hmm. when you could buy one for, yeah. as they called it, the Mitsubishi Zero. <laughs> right. um, so, so not that one. Okay, so so they're saying that, and then you know Ford is is saying you know that we're going to have this new leadership position in alternative powertrains as well. Mm -hmm. So you know you were mentioning about how when you were in the Pacific Northwest that you saw a lot of people that were very very acutely sensitive about mm -hmm. environmental issues, and. Uh, Earlier, John and I were talking about, um, you know, that you have this this phenomenon of young people that, uh, you know, led by the Greta Thunberg, uh, you know, saying, hey, mm -hmm. you know, we got to do something about the planet. So the question that I, I sort of have is, is this possibly going to have a negative impact on companies like General Motors and Toyota with a generation of people that seem to be coming regarding, oh, you know, I would emissions? think I would think so. I mean, if you saw the Twitterverse yesterday. You know. But then it's funny, okay. all the autonomous vehicle advocates are telling us that young kids don't want to drive anyway. So they really wouldn't be customers for next generation vehicles, Ooh, if you believe interesting that. Point. Interesting you know? point. If you believe that. If, I'm not if sure you believe I that. that. Right, but. right. So. Hey, look, we got to come back to, to talking more about this. But first, uh, shout out to our good friends at Bridgestone. Okay, we're back talking about all things automotive, especially this, this battle between the Trump administration and the EPA. You know, Michelle, California. You, or California, excuse me. Um, yeah, Trump EPA versus California yeah. Air Resources Board. Michelle, you had uh, mentioned that maybe there was some deal that I'm Toyota went on board with, uh, with Trump because it wants protection from, from tariffs. I mean, I'm just I, guessing on that. I, I, I'd add a couple of other things. I, I've heard from backroom sources that Toyota is really furious with California that when the Great Recession hit, the state never helped it. When it decided to close down NUMI, 
uh, state gave it all kinds of crap and that they didn't so Toyota didn't so much leave California as it felt it was driven out of California. Mm -hmm. So there's no love lost between those two. And if you remember back a, a few years ago when shortly after Trump was elected, he came to Michigan and he met with all these auto executives. Sergio was there, Mark mm -hmm. Fields was there, Jim Lentz was there. And Trump started going after Lentz. Yes, Jim Lentz being that. the former head of Toyota U.S. Current head. Current head. Cur current yeah. head. Yeah. And he kept telling him, Jim Lentz, I want a new plant from Toyota. He kept That's going after right. So my guess is, if you remember, a week before the strike, Mary Barra went to Washington and met with Trump. Correct. And nobody would say anything about the meeting. They wouldn't say, like, in diplomatic talk, oh, it was, you know, contentious but productive or whatever mm -hmm. their terminology. No one said anything. So that's when my radar went up. I thought, oh, they cut a deal. Yeah. And I think the deal went like this. Mary, if you join my team against California, I'll never mention you on Twitter again. And she said, deal. Mm. That's what I think happened with that one. And Ford, I think, is playing the long game, to your point, Gary, that, you know, what if Trump loses the election next year? Right. I mean, whatever new president is going to say, hey, no problem, California, here's your waiver, right back again. Right. And then what do the others do? And, uh, and even if Trump is reelected, I think Ford, BMW, Volkswagen, and Honda are saying, you know what, long, long term, mm -hmm. electric and climate change, you know, that's not going away and we're playing for the long game here. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and you, to go back to your point earlier, I mean, these are clearly global automakers, right? I mean, right. Ford is still in Europe mm -hmm. and in other parts of the world. General Motors has pulled back from Europe at least. Um, Volkswagen, of course, they're 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 all in on electricity. It's a great um, point. We we kind of live in this bubble here of cheap fuel and V8 engines and right. big trucks and so forth, and we we forget that there is these companies have to do business globally. Mm -hmm. It's a great point. Yeah, and so you know you spend your development dollars and make them work as hard as you can. But right. so what do you guys think is going to happen with this battle? Between it'll go to the it'll be in the courts for a long time, and you know to your point, what happens when there if if a Democrat wins the White House next year, um, that could change the game, but it'll be in the courts. I mean, there's speculation it could even go to the Supreme Court, and then what happens? Because it's a state's right state's issue. Right, yeah. right. It but it's amendment. a Trump court, you know. So, well, yeah, yeah, but 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 yeah. they like it both ways too, you know. That's right. But it, you know, it just sort of feels like you know we're we're at a point now where there are more people, you know, to back to your Pacific Northwest that are, mm -hmm. are paying more attention to this. I mean, you know, every time when we go to Europe, I mean, I think there's a greater awareness there of, of recycling and things like that. And certainly in Japan, like it seems like well, that even way forever. Well, in downtown Seattle, I was, it was amazing how quiet the traffic was because so many are hybrids, so many, you know, there are electrics. It, it was, mm -hmm. so, you know, there are pockets in this country. Too. Right. Yeah, it's absolutely interesting. You know, you mentioned FCA in passing and so the other Blockbuster yeah, story. Yeah, like man, <laughs> that the, should have been the lead. The, the strike in the uh, the <laughs> EPA. Kind of, but to, to your point, so you know, Fiat Chrysler announces a deal with France's uh, PSA. Uh, what's really been interesting is it hasn't been that big news yeah, in I some know. ways. And it's sort of like, oh, another one? Yeah. You know, I wonder if it's different in Europe, because this is really a European play. You know, Fiat True. Chrysler is a European True. company. Right. PSA is definitely a European. So I wonder if this is just Except that bigger. Renault, the Renault deal was crazy. I mean, I, I was getting calls all all hours of the night. Okay, so maybe since, they're not just not calling Okay, either. since this since this isn't such big news that there may be some people listening that won't know what the hell we're talking okay. about here. So you know we should sort of back up yeah. A, yeah. a few steps here and, and basically <laughs> yeah. say that with what's been within what the last five days maybe that we've become aware of the fact that uh, there were talks that were going on right. between uh, PSA, which has Peugeot and Citroen and uh, DS in China and Opel. Opel, Opel, that's yes. right. Opel, that's right. They, they bought that from from, yeah. from uh, General Motors, and then um, you know FCA. Still making Buicks, right? Um, and it's it seemed like this thing just went, you know, presto. But let's remember, if they were talking before the Renault deal, so like last early last spring, late last winter, Peugeot and uh, Fiat Chrysler had been talking, and then all of a sudden the Renault deal came up. So they kind of went. It seems to me they kind of went back to the. Yeah. So, so they're talking about just putting both the companies together 50-50, mm -hmm. and um, it would be a $50 billion company that would be headquarters in the Netherlands. And Carlos Tavares, well, who is presently 
the CEO of PSA will become the CEO of whatever this company will be called. Does anybody know? There are no. two vowels, two A's, okay? A P and S. Some form a word from that. I mean, they've got to make a word up for this, yeah. you know? They can't call it PSA FCA or FCA PSA. What are they going to call it? That's a good question. So, the, so they're claiming the combination will have a $4.1 billion savings and they will close no plants. Well, that's what you always say. <laughs> We're going to save all this money and no one's going to lose their job. Don't right. anybody uh, worry. Right. Exactly what they, I was on the earnings call this morning. That isn't exactly what they said. They're, they're, they, they use the term uh, better utilizing manpower. So it struck me that, you know, like that could mean some closings of plants. Yeah. Although it's hard it's to very close hard. plants in Europe. It's very hard. And they need their plants in North America. I don't right. think they've got anything that they could chop here. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. There had been some talk of Peugeot returning to the North American. There is, they, that is a plan. Larry Dominique? Yeah. Yeah, he's in yeah. You know, But it goes beyond that. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, you know, I'm not looking forward to that moment. I, I, think, I think that ship has sailed. Uh, I think we saw Fiat trying to bring Fiat back. Alpha hasn't really set the world on fire. That's a great brand. Peugeot, uh, you know, who knows? I think the Chinese, some of the Chinese brands probably have a better chance long term in this market than Peugeot does, certainly than Renault does. So, uh, you know, global bill of material savings and scale and that kind of thing, maybe. But we saw what happened with Nissan and Renault. There wasn't as, it wasn't as big as they claimed it would be mm -hmm. in that area. So, as yeah, I said they, to they're someone never, today, it's, it's, these always look good on paper. But making them all work is, and nobody knows that better than Fiat Chrysler. And, and you know, na nationalism still plays in these kind of things when you're talking about European-based uh, automakers. The U.S. seems to get along with kind of everybody at some point, you know, and they get along with us. But when you pit, you know, Fiat and Renault and Peugeot, and we saw that whole thing play out with Ghosn and whatnot, there are knives out with these companies all the mm -hmm. time. So I don't know. You know, interesting. Uh, history aspect to the PSA Chrysler connection. Uh, in, we, we had this on AutoLine Daily this morning. So uh, if you go back to the early 1960s, GM and Ford went on this expansion binge in Europe. And then Chrysler decided, hey, we better get on board with this too. But they were late to the party. So they bought three dogs of companies. They got Simca in France. They got Roots in England. They got this Barrieros in Spain. They lumped it together and called it Fiat, or they called it Chrysler Europe. And then uh, it, it, it didn't work. It never made money. They, they poured all this cash into it. And then by the late 70s, Chrysler is in trouble. Mm -hmm. Lee Iacocca lands at Chrysler in 1978. One of the first things he does is he sells Chrysler Europe to Peugeot <laughs> for a dollar. So <laughs> here's the second run of Chrysler getting bought by Peugeot, or at least back then a all part of Chrysler. All right, so let me ask each of you. Okay, so speaking of Chrysler, if this deal goes through and we know that Citron and Peugeot have these nice big sedans and they have a number of cars in their lineup and they're sort of late to the party in terms of SUVs that they're, they're developing, but they have nice, luxurious sedans. Does Chrysler brand survive? Well, I think that's regardless of Peugeot. Yeah. I think there's a question of does Chrysler brand survive? I mean, they've got the 300 in the Pacifica. Yeah. Neither doing particularly well. So yeah, I think so how, much you, how, how long do you give them? I don't know. They got to figure out what to do. I mean, they could drop the 300, and but figure out what to do with the Pacifica. I I, I don't know. You know, I I think the I think uh, Pacifica will stay as a Chrysler brand. You know, these are all sold in dealerships that sell all the FCA brands. You know, Alpha separate, Fiat separate, but you know the rest of the FCA brands are all in one store. So if you drop a brand, you don't really save any money. And if the public's mind is the Pacifica is a Chrysler, it's a Chrysler. So you have a Chrysler in the store with, with Dodges and Rams and all the other stuff. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I think the question is, I'd love to see a modernized 300, maybe hybridized or electric. Um, the big question is, what's going to happen with that vehicle? We're talking about two nameplates here, Pacifica and 300. 300 is like ancient right now. We saw what they did with the ancient Challenger and Charger, and the Hemi engine kind of has just kept that going with low gas prices. So these two remaining nameplates, Pacifica, I think, still has a future. It's one of a few minivans left. 300, big sedan, 
V8 power, it has to be transformed almost. I don't give it a lot of... And it's a car. It's a People car. People don't want cars. I don't give it a lot and of by future, the way, Pacifica, really. the other thing that keeps Pacifica going, there's a lot of fleet sales. A lot of fleet sales, those, right. Van segment, right. So. But, you know, uh, Charger and Challenger doing very, very well. Huge. Very, very well. I, know. They, they, I predict they won't forever. Yeah. I, th I see them going but, the but way But they have Harley that muscle David. car thing that's still, they, I mean, credit to them. We talked about that with Ralph Gilles here. I mean, credit to those guys. They're magicians, right. appropriate for Halloween, yeah. mm -hmm. um, in, in keeping this whole thing going. Right. I mean, demons and hellcats and wild colors and uh, wide bodies. I mean, it's, But here's the thing. You know, I know the new replacements were already designed. Yeah. They're not coming until 2023. I know. Why? I know. And I know, I know, because I've talked to people who have seen the cars. I know people who have worked on the cars. Why was it delayed to 2023? It's, it's got to be and a At capital. that point, well, why bother, <laughs> it seems like. Yeah. No, no, I, look, performance is not going away. You know, it's going to have to be hybridized, but we've all seen that, you know, the fastest race cars in the world, Formula One, WEC, they're all hybrids anyway. So I'm sure they're going to be hybridized. But what I'm getting at is it's got to be a capital allocation thing. I thought at first it was going to be a bargaining chip with uh, the Canadian mm -hmm. Union, Unifor. With the plan. Up yeah. There. Which, hey, you give us a good contract. Then we'll get, yeah. 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 So uh, I, but I know the cars are done and I got to just believe that. Somehow they just didn't have the cash to do those cars right now, and it got shunted aside. Like another one, uh, the Journey, the Dodge Journey is still mm. selling pretty well. It's as old as the hills. Mm -hmm. Huge incentives on it. Yeah. Huge, yeah. I know, but the package on it is terrific. Mm -hmm. And if they would only update that, they could have great sales. So I, I think they've got too much money going into trying to keep Fiat alive, trying to keep Maserati well, and Alpha going. And by going. the way, yeah. that came up on the earnings call today. They are um, going to dial back the capital spending on Alfa Romeo. I think Maserati also hmm. redo the product lines in terms of wow. what are they going to offer? What are they? They're, they're really looking for them to be premium, high profit margin. They said a little vague, refocus them on markets where they've done well or products that have done well. Uh -oh. So they're, uh -oh. and, and they specifically to push out the capital spending. Hmm. All right, Michelle, you, you hmm. said when they were talking about the performance cars, you said you see this like Harley Davidson. Now, oh, come now, on, now, now, guys. Now explain what you mean about this. This because is very interesting. I have thought this for a long time. I mean, look at where Harley Davidson is. They're, they're, you know, they've run out of their market. Run out has, of boomers. Well, yeah. yeah. Right. And I think that the Challenger and Charger will face that day. That uh, And muscle cars in general. That's my view. Um, that, you know, they're baby boomer cars. I don't see millennials. Maybe in Detroit you do, but, you know, they're not cars for millennials. They're Talk to the, uh, the Dodge people on that. I think you'd be surprised by some of the demographics that are coming into that I'm segment. I'm sure they but, say that. But, but these are not regular, everyday millennials. These are high-income millennials yeah. that are going after those cars. Okay. Hey, we got to take another quick break. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to Michelle's skepticism mm. and the next thing on Gary's list. But first, a shout out to our good friends at DIAMTS and at Borg Warner. Whether they're electric, autonomous, or connected, tomorrow's cars must be developed quickly with the highest precision, and they have to be lightweight. DIAMTS can provide what you need from advanced manufacturing machinery to lightweight components. Learn more at our website at www.d-iamts.com or visit our showroom right next to Metro Airport in Detroit. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. All right, we're back on the Halloween-themed After Hours. And uh, it'd be frightening if it weren't. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're going to get into Dr. Data, but before we do, we got a, uh, uh, a note here from Stephen who says, Hello, Dr. Data. This is Stephen. Shook your hand in the hallway today. Said I was a huge fan of AutoLine. So, so, so this was in the Ford Product Development Center today. And you were with me, John, and he said you know, he was very happy to see us both. Yeah. And uh, 
What, what, a, what a nice thing. So thank you, Stephen. Yeah. So we should tell the audience what we're seeing, even though we can't tell them much about it. You can tell them. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's all got to do with that Mustang-themed electric CUV that's going to be announced at the LA Auto Show. I, I'm not giving out anything that hasn't already been announced. Mm. But that's why we were there. They've shown a silhouette of this car. We yeah. can reveal, um, you know, the, the C-pillar and the sail panel look very kind of Mustang fastbacky. Mm -hmm. Right. You know. They've talked about a 300-mile range right. and really good performance. Right. I think that's... We'll, we'll, do a sh we'll do a show on this. In, in so yeah. we'll, we'll do, I, yeah. yeah it's this, Did they uh, reveal a name for this car, or is that going to be we announced? We can't talk about it. Okay, okay. Can't talk about it. Okay. So, so uh, let's, Even let's go to the number okay. here. Okay. <laughs> so we're not going to, we're not going <laughs> to, I don't want to get him thrown <laughs> out of every Ford program for the rest of his <laughs> life. <laughs> okay, Dr. Data. All right, so, so those of you who are watching this uh, online, there will be no image on the screen, but we're going to do this by waving my arms around a lot. And since I have these experts here, especially Michelle, who knows all about things, about OEMs and numbers and things like oh, that, gosh. And, and vehicle sales and, and so on and so forth. And this, this, is, this is thematic. This is something we've talked about, sort of, but it has nothing to do with Halloween. Okay? Okay. So this, this is um, this OEM has a vehicle that it has sold 290,000 for the first half of 2019. It wow. expects to sp sell 310,000 for the second half, thereby resulting in 600,000 vehicles being sold in 2019. What is this vehicle? Is this in the U.S. market? This is global. Global. Oh. Okay. 600,000. You want to take a stab at that, no. Michelle? I, I, it's got to be like uh, Corolla. Yeah, I was thinking. Think a little more out of the box. A little more out of the box. It's a vehicle. Camry. <laughs> that's not out of the box. <laughs> on, I said that facetiously. Uh, right. I have no idea. Come on. Just a uh, wild guess. 600,000. Out of the box, so it's outside the Corolla Accord Camry realm. Not golf either, then. That's not out of the box. Not golf. You guys are killing me. We're not imaginative today, I guess. Not These, Tesla. Okay, really. so, so, so this, this, get, this gets back to our environmental discussion. Mm -hmm. Electric e-bikes built by oh. Giant, the Taiwanese manufacturer uh, okay. of bicycles. Okay. And, okay, so here, here's... So not only is that number astonishing, okay, 600,000 e-bikes, right? That the global e-bike market was valued at more than 14.75 billion in 2018 and is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 6.39% to 2024. I mean, literally billions of dollars are being well, spent. Well, if you on think about things. China and India and yeah. even Europe, yeah. sure. Right. This is why I'd always ask analysts talking about the Chinese electrification market when they talk about EVs. Are you including bicycles and scooters and everything? Because it's such a huge thing over there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. wow. this, gets, this gets back to the point, you know, talk, again, the environmental thing. I mean, a lot of these people are basically saying, hey, you know, we've got we've to switch up things. And, I mean, do you think this would have any impact on automotive sales? You know, those markets are so different. I mean, if you think about India and you think about China, it's they're moving up from a regular bicycle, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't. I but what don't I'm thinking think of is, you, like Ford, it's possible Ford in, in, the deal in with, cities. Well, Mahindra recently, and right. and you know, you've got you know General Motors. Um, a lot of its sales are predicated on China, mm -hmm. and you know whether the, the people in those countries just may say, well, maybe I really don't need to buy a regular automobile maybe we can well and i make, think if you yeah. commute where there's public transportation you need to get from you know the public transportation center from home i think mm -hmm. that's where it works yeah you look at there's a proliferation and, and, of these look at a bicycling magazine there's there's entire publications that deal with this market you know and we know you know continental and bosch these big suppliers have have bicycles that they don't make the frames but they make the drive line these are six and seven thousand dollar propositions mm -hmm. They would be privately owned, but there's a there's a division there between bike sharing, mm -hmm. which is last mile, and this whole thing of automation, 
and privately owned bikes. And people that will live in Stuttgart, you know, and you're just never going to take the car because gas is expensive, you might invest six grand in a bicycle you could charge every night. These are really expensive. I don't think North America is ready for that sort of two-wheeler. I mean, that's, you're getting into motorcycle territory. You could buy a good used Harley for $7,000. Um, that's what happens to those Harleys. Yeah, that's what happens to those Harleys, you know. Is this going to affect four-wheel sales over here? I don't think so. I, I think this is part of that mobility thing where you just unlock one and put your card in and push the app and go, you know, and it's not your bike and you leave it somewhere. See, I'll take a contrarian view. I, I, I think it is already starting to have an impact mm -hmm. on car sales. Uh, I, I think it's KPMG has done this interesting uh, study looking at VMT, vehicle miles travel, mm -hmm. and seeing what percentage of that is now becoming mobility stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, last mile especially, look, look at these scooters. The scooters have gone crazy mm -hmm. I know. globally. Yeah. And uh, who was I talking to? Um, one of the guys at Automotive News who covers all the, you know, the new mobility stuff. Pete things. Bigelow, maybe? Yeah, Pete Bigelow, yeah. thanks. So at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, you know, the big music concert and stuff and all that, they, at, at the last one, they allowed the scooters to come in. They were everywhere. And he said, the police said there was a noticeable decrease in congestion, traffic congestion, passenger car, mm. truck congestion, because so many people were using the scooters. It's just that now the scooters are littering everywhere. Yeah, they call it right. scooter Mageddon on the sidewalk. How many you know, in the rivers? Private property, and, and store owners are really complaining about this, you know? But, you know, uh, that's partly because the, the pioneers in it, Lime and uh, Bird, Bird. Bird yeah. Just sort of went out and threw scooters oh, on the city mm -hmm. sidewalks. Container right? loads full of them. So yeah. contrast that to the way that Ford went about it. Ford's uh, got this scooter company called Spin. They yeah. went into Ann Arbor, but they approached the city fathers, the city council, blah, 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 blah. They worked everything out. And so there's not this massive backlash in Ann Arbor like there's been in other cities. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be the template for how we go forward with them. Well, I think, I think there's some... Um, uh, regional weather issues to yep. climate issues. You know, San Diego, this is probably a year-round kind of a thing. Michigan, maybe not so much. And then you look at this autonomous summoning capability that Tesla's had and so forth, and, you know, do I, do I summon my car from a parking lot or in that last mile or whatever, or do I take one of these kind of little kick-and-go scooters? And, I, you know, we're in, a, we're in really a, kind of a gray area in terms of transportation right now. Interesting time. Mm hmm Very interesting. Yeah, I just sort of, I mean, so Brussels, Belgium is planning to ban all internal combustion engines, diesel and gasoline powered by 2035. Another city jumping okay. on that bandwagon. I mean, 20, I mean yeah. that's right. it. I mean, so, so what are these people going to do for transportation? Well, get electric. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they'll ban the ICEs. And in fact, I, I looked it up. If you look at all the countries that have said they're going to ban the ICE by 2030, yeah. it's about 12 million vehicles a year that are represented in those countries. And that doesn't include other cities like Barcelona that has taken it upon itself to say we're going to ban them. So uh, it's already started. The answer is going to be mobility services and or it's going to be, hey, I've got an electric car. Let me in. Or... Uh, the, the way that others are trying to argue, I've got a plug-in hybrid, so I'll only drive it in electric mode in the city. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to kill you. Know, New York City has this whole kind of strata of vehicle owners that you really don't see them on the street until you're out in the street and you go, there's a Hummer. Why, why would anyone own a Hummer? And there's like underground parking garages, levels of them full of Ferraris and exotic stuff and big SUVs and all kind of wild stuff. You don't think of those city owners being car people, but there's big cultures in these cities, L.A. and New York. And you're going to tell these people that they can't drive those vehicles when they're paying, I don't know, what it takes to park these things in, a, yeah. in an apartment complex in the city, thousands of dollars. There's going to be some push and shove with all this, but, you know, it's, it is coming. I mean, London, there's got to be a hellish amount of great cars that are kind of squirreled away in London for people to get out into the countryside on the weekend. You know, they, I guess they'll just pay a tax. Which, which goes back to Bob Lutz's idea of that they'll be like horses, that uh, you'll take them out on the weekends. and mm -hmm. this will Exercise be, this them will on be, the weekend, will, yeah, right. But right. for, you know, normal 
commuting. Well, that's more fun. I mean, it's not fun to commute. No. So no matter what you're driving. Yeah. Right. Who hates, uh, who loves stop and go traffic? Mm -hmm. So Hyundai announced that it is going to uh, launch a self-driving vehicle shuttle service in Southern California. I saw that. To, to you know, get to your point of who wants to drive in rush mm -hmm. hours. Um, so is, is, is this just they need to do it to show that they can do it, or is, is there something to this? What do you think, Lindsay? I, I think there's a bandwagon going on right now that everybody has to show their technology. This is for Wall Street and everything else within the industry to show that they're, they're in part of the game. They're playing in the game. And they're not the laggard. They're not the laggard, right. And it gives their engineers a chance to kind of work these systems up and, and validate them and so forth. But, um, you know, and it gets the nameplate of the car out, and they just better hope that one of these things doesn't run into another car and crash, and their name is on it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've talked to some people, though, who have been really impressed by how far and how fast Hyundai has come in autonomy Huge. and mobility. Yeah. You know, a year ago, they were like nowhere. Right. Nowhere. Well, obviously, behind the scenes, they were laying the groundwork. And what, what's it? It's called Bot Ride, I think, is the, the service. Uh, I think you're Whatever, right. but I it, don't. Oh, yeah, it's on the car, the yeah. picture on the screen, Bot Ride. So <laughs> I, I think this is critically important that people. And those are electric conas, too. That, that common everyday citizens see autonomous vehicles, get in autonomous vehicles and experience yeah. what they're like. Right. Because SAE's done some terrific work in this regard, right. where they put real life citizens. Public demos, yeah. Public and, demo. And, and, and it's all about confidence. And I was at an SAE conference today where they're talking about public confidence in all this technology is really key. Yes. I think it'll start happening in geofence, like go to the airport and the shuttles from the, you know, the blue deck to the Delta terminal, and you'll, you'll be there and you'll start to see, okay, it's following its way around, it's dropping people off, it's no, no problems, you know, it's just, it's experiential and just observ observing all of this. And that's just why, I mean, Waymo's doing that and, and Phoenix else. And, and more and more without a, a drive, you know, just self, really Without people inside yeah. there, right. right. And, and so what I like about what SAE has done with these public demonstrations is it shows 80% of the people getting in the car are very leery mm -hmm. about it. Right. 10 minutes later, 80% of the people are totally good with the technology. Mm -hmm. right. uh, that's how fast the public mindset will change. Right now, all the polls show people are very wary about this mm -hmm. because they've never seen it. They've never been. They heard long. about the fatality. They heard about the yeah. fatality, yeah, yeah. and that they broad brush. Yeah. So all AVs are dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but it's a step function because. I saw an animation today of a future looking, uh, a plan view of a future four way intersection with no traffic lights in the intersection. And it reminds you of like the Jetsons and all these things of the future of, of aerial vehicles kind of just going like this in these future cities, Star Wars, nothing's hitting each other. And this intersection was, you're almost like looking at just kind of ants running around and nothing is running into each other. And that's, that's obviously an ideal for the future, but to get up even partway to that confidence level is gonna take a long time. Yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's probably not in our lifetime. That's not in our lifetime. We've also found that when we do studies on like, um, assisted driving, driving systems, you know, that are in luxury cars and that kind of thing. Luxury car buyers are more comfortable with the idea of autonomous vehicles because they've experienced all these technologies that are the steps up. So right. I think that's, that's a important first step. Right, but you know, we, we all complain too, as the public does, about the inconsistencies yes. with level one and level two technologies, you know, lane keeping and automatic emergency braking and it's different car to car, brand to brand, and we've got to tighten that up. As but remember, we, that happened on stability control and anti-light brakes. Right. We're old enough to all remember oh, that here, but yeah, oh, right. the stability control systems all work differently. Some were really abrupt, yeah. some were, and so I think we will get there, but I think you're absolutely right. Well, but I right. think the problem, though, is, is that you drive a lot of different cars. We do, Most people yes. buy a car, yes. and, and, and live with it for, right. you yeah, know, know, X number of years, know. and therefore it's just like, works perfect. That's what it does. Yeah. 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 It's just like, it's it, bounce, just, it bounces back between the lane lines, you yeah. know, yeah. It's just, <laughs> okay, I know Gary's got more on his list of topics we got to get into, but first we got to have another commercial break with a shout out to our good friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, 
including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. All right, we're back with the Halloween After Hours. I love your tie, by the way. I, I know, you know. Very Take subtle. yourself seriously. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard to talk about serious subjects wearing this clown tie, but <laughs> hey, I'm going with the flow here. Mm -hmm. All right, so talking about a semi-serious subject, Tesla, because we haven't talked about them, and that seems to be the uh, thing that drives all news nowadays. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that uh, Volkswagen CEO Herbert Dice said that Tesla is not a niche automaker, and he's taking it very seriously. Well, it's not. I mean, if you look at the, even the, I just look at the U.S., I mean, the Model 3 is the best-selling uh, luxury Asca. car. Yeah, and we do a quarterly thing called Brand Watch, where we look at consumer perceptions and shopping consideration. Shopping consideration for all Tesla models, mostly in Model 3, off the charts. Now, there's a lot of window shoppers there, so the interest is there. Um, it, it's remarkable. And, and we measure in terms of what are the most important factors to luxury buyers. We have 12 factors. They lead in seven of them. Really? So the strength of brand is remarkable. So, so what's, the, what's the delta between Tesla and number two? I mean, is, is it like uh, you look at it? And I'd, I'd have to look at it. But, but uh, is, it, is it surprising to you? Um, yes, and, and they've been there for, I, I've done this for the last couple of years, they've been in those spots, and we keep thinking, you know, if bad news hits that maybe the, it'll, um, they'll waver, it, not at all, not at all. Hmm. It's remarkable. Hmm. And you figure VW, Audi is coming in, Audi on the luxury side, Tesla's a luxury brand, VW is, has this big electrification push going, and I mean, that's the incumbent. I mean, that's the 800-pound gorilla in electrification. If VW and Dees are moving into into that big time, ubiquitously, uh, you know, high scale, they've got to say, how do we, you know, how do we coexist with the mindset of the customer base that's out there already? Mm -hmm. And that's their people that like electric cars. So, I, you know. I, One I, data point, though, that I think is uh, I, I need to look more into is I had read that for the third quarter, Tesla sales in the U.S. were down 40 percent. Hmm. Uh, I th thought it was 21 percent. 21 percent? Okay. They were down a lot. But Still I a think big drop. it is. I think, though, they sent a lot of production overseas. Oh, God, sure. No, no, no. I'm mm -hmm. sure they did. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're, they're total sales, and that's a great yeah. strategy. All I'm saying is that, as we've seen in every other market, when the subsidies get cut, the sales mm -hmm. Well, go that, down. And that is, you know, they're going down, down, down. So. Michelle, what do you think of them in China and this new plant? How they're going to do? You know, I don't know enough about it. Um, I so focus on the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question because I haven't been there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I know a little bit about it. Number one, that plant came up faster Fast. than anybody has ever seen before. Now, they haven't started building cars. I know they're, they're doing pre production stuff. Let's see when they get up to line speed, but I'll bet it comes up pretty quick. Uh, the Chinese are crazy about Tesla. They love Well, the they're brand, brand conscious. They're very brand, brand yeah. conscious. Culture. Uh, Elon Musk is highly regarded in China, including, most importantly, by senior Communist Party leadership. They love the guy. Mm. So my guess is Tesla's going to give all the Chinese automakers a run for their money, at least those in the same price segment it's in. Yeah. If you want to start looking cheaper, no, I don't think Tesla wants to play there anyway. Mm. But, you know... If it, it, just to put it in dollar terms, forty thousand dollars and up, I'll bet they dominate that Chinese market. So this, this this raises an interesting point, though. That okay, they're crazy about Tesla, and you said that you know you you do your surveys, Brands. it's mm -hmm. Tesla. So do other automakers? really have a chance in this well, space? Well, I've wondered that, too, because they're established brands, they have certain yeah. reputations, and they don't have this mystique, they don't have this cult-like leader. Uh, that is a big well, question. Well, I, I look at it from the point of view, isn't it like the difference between someone, you know, some years ago who had the choice between buying a Mac and buying a mm -hmm. Dell, right? I mean, and so the cool kids would buy the Apple, and mm -hmm. so now the cool kids would buy the Tesla rather than buying, yeah. you know, whatever else just because I it's think not is whatever the, else. I think that will be a challenge for but, other. But don't you think a, a key thing is Tesla's up to now, up, up until the Taycan, has been the only one out there with a really cool looking electric car. True. Yeah. You know, the others were compliance cars mm -hmm. and no, made yes. no bones about it. You know, we're just going to take an existing car, gut it, stuff it full of batteries and call it a day. Tesla went from the ground up brand new and it really paid off. The Taycan 
you know, it, okay, so they're going to have a cheaper model, only $100,000 plus. You know, the, the, the real crux of the matter when it comes to EVs and selling in volume is, can you get them down to 30 grand, mm -hmm. 25 grand, mm -hmm. and make a profit? In an which, SUV. Which brings, yeah. up, the what the which brings up the Model Y is the future of that. There's that, but, I, you know, I come back to this, and Gary is going to kill me in a minute, but this Mustang-inspired electric Ford CUV. This thing's got the potential to be really hot, too. Mm. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see, can the Taycan eat from the top? Can Ford right. eat from the bottom? Mm -hmm. Will either of these vehicles make anything of a dent in, in right. Tesla? So far, from what I've seen, they're the only two that have got any chance at doing it. See, but I wonder whether, whether Tesla couldn't come out with what would be essentially a corrugated cardboard box. It have the Tesla logo on it, maybe make an electric car, <laughs> and it's just like, you know, people say, I want that, yeah. Yeah. you know, just, just yeah. because mm -hmm. it's a Tesla, yeah. you know, and, and it's not a Ford or it's not a Volkswagen or it's not an Audi. Mm. And I just wonder whether this is, this is one of these types of technology. Well, to that point, I don't think they're necessarily buying, oh, it's electric. It happens to be electric, but it's Tesla. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah, and it's, but at some point that string's got to get played I, I out. I would think, mm. but, you know. But we haven't seen yeah, it. I don't think we haven't so. seen it yet. But the thing is, it's not just this Elon Musk cult of personality that they're following, though they are. The car is terrific. The driving experience is fantastic. The charging experience is better than anything else that's out there. That right. big screen, the over-the-air updates. So they're cashing the check with real things, you know, that customers really appreciate. And then you, you got the icing on it, which is, oh, Elon, we love you so much. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and sort of to the point of, of electric vehicles, that 30 grand sort of thing, and, and, and this, is, this, is a, this is a brand that surprises me hasn't done better in the U.S. market, which is Mini, that... You know, I thought that that would be like a continued. Everybody wanted uh, them that got them. Yeah. Right. Got it was, them it was just, it was just one of those. I thought mm -hmm. they would have some legs. But so they're going to come out with a Mini Cooper SE, an electric vehicle. They're going to retail it for about 30 grand. And, you know, it, it really, really surprises me that this is going to have a range of maybe a maximum of 168 miles. It's a compliance car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but they're they're banking on this as being like a cool mini. Rats a ruck, boys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think I think range is still uh, really primary to any customer, no matter what nameplate they're affiliated with, and that I, that's not getting the job done. What do you think the number should be? Uh, over two hundred for a small car and you know for a car that size you're talking about a major battery pack with huge weight to it mm -hmm. so I, I, I think the the real decider in this market is going to be the electric pickup truck I really do you know from it, it's American it's the market it's the volume it's the duty cycle test on whether you can you know commercial owners can can use it um, you know I, I think that's going to decide really you know, we know GM's working on it. We know Ford's working on it. FCA's got to be. We got Rivian. We got Tesla allegedly working on it. I, I think that's sometime this next decade, I think that's going to really be the decider. Do you think F-150, Ram, and Silverado buyers will buy electric ones? John, I, I wonder that crossover, okay, now how do you migrate those people into electrics? How do you do that? You've got to convince them, Torque. you know? Well, you know, you go, if you're going to go electric, you go after a different customer. You go after early adopters who want something cool, who are more upscale, they got the money to spend, they want something different, blah, 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 blah. I don't see pickup buyers in that category okay. at all. But I yeah. do think there is a market for electric pickups. But I believe it's not going to be the traditional buyer. I believe it's going to bring in buyers who otherwise would not ever buy an F-150 Silverado or Ram. It's so the impossible is... burger of vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But, but is, so is, is this purely the recreational buyer then? Um, it, it's not a commercial buyer. Let, let's put it that way. And it may not be recreational. It might be somebody who says, you know, I, I would love to have a pickup. You know, I, I've got... Whatever it is, jet skis or, you know, uh, motorcycles or fill in the blank. I, I need to do some stuff uh, around, around my home or my yeah. farm or whatever. It's going to be an upscale buyer. And I could see them go, say, thinking I wouldn't be seen dead in a traditional big American pickup. Yeah. Wouldn't, you'll never. 
but uh, an electric Rivian, ooh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, or a I, Bollinger. Or a Bollinger, right. Yeah, I, I just look at some things, you know, Ford's play on aluminum. Uh, Ford's play with EcoBoost, which everybody said, you know, I mean, they went to 50% penetration with a turbocharged V6 mm -hmm. within a year. So there are paradigms that can be broken in this. And eventually, as you were saying, you know, with, with cities and so forth, you won't be able to take a gasoline engine vehicle places where people want to go. And if we get a change of administration, that could be sooner than we think. So, you know, these guys, I, I think, you know, GM and the incumbents saw that Tesla was working on this. Then Rivian comes out. And if they weren't working on it, you know, it's time to kind of get things going. In that yeah, here we got a picture of the Rivian truck up on the screen. Yeah, so I, I, I still think that's going to be for this marketplace. You know, can you make that work? If you can, I think electrics are here to stay. Michelle, do you guys look at the possibility of electric pickup trucks as being well i have to be a little careful because cox oh. automotive is an investor in rivian oh that's so. right i forgot about that <laughs> oh rivian yes. trucks are going to sell yeah well. exactly. <laughs> yeah so i have to be a little careful about what i say never mind <laughs> hey we've got some questions from the audience should we get to sure, that absolutely okay so i'll throw it, uh, these out to you guys alexander kurabitsis wrote in michelle will the corporate cultures of FCA and PSA mesh together well? Well, that is the big question. I mean, that, that was my point about it looks good on paper, but it's the people that have to make it work. And we've seen when that hasn't worked. Uh, I mean, go back to the Daimler. That looked really good on paper. The cultures did not mesh at all. So. That's right. And it depends on how they operate them, too. I mean, there's the U.S. operations that I assume will be fairly independent, but it's hard to say. Well, and like I said earlier, there's the U.S. is kind of the center of the Venn diagram for all these M&As. But when you get these European companies, right. I, I think that's very difficult. And we saw, we saw Renault and Nissan. That was allegedly all working until the whole Gone thing came out. And you realize just what, a, right. what, 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 yeah, what a horrible thing it was. Uh, you know, PSA, I mean, there's been, there's been some internal issues there as well. So will this work with these guys? I don't know. It's a great example of the, uh, uh, what was it, the merger, merger, of, equals. merger of equals, right. Oh, here. Use that today. Interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was there any mention, what's happening to Mike Manley? There yeah. was no mention. They were very careful not to talk a whole lot about the. So, um, so the uh, existing CEO of FCA is just seemingly. In place right now, not talking about. They said very little today. On the, There's been some sec speculation he might be the chief operating officer, but that's Who just knows? speculation, right? And Elkan is going to be the main chairman. guy, he's chairman. He's going to be the chairman. Yeah, this is interesting. You know, it's now uh, the Agnelli family and the Peugeot families, you know, yeah. are together. And maybe mm -hmm. this comes back to what you're saying, Michelle. Will those cultures yep. of the owners yeah. mesh well? And then well. you've got the French government in there, too, which upset the, the Renault deal. Right. So. I didn't realize this. Dong Fung is a big mm -hmm. investor yes. in Peugeot, too. 10%. 13.7. Wow. It's about 10. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Here's another one. Uh, so, Gary, this is an interesting one. Uh, Kit Gerhardt says, no home charging at my condo is keeping me away from EVs for now. Mm -hmm. How big a problem? Do you, do you think public charging stations will alleviate that? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, think about this for a minute. I mean, how many of us have gas pumps at our homes? That'd be zero, right? So we just all go to gas stations, and this is just part of our lives. Mm -hmm. So going to fast charging stations, which I would say that there's this explosion of numbers, but I can't say that because it's, I might give something away. You, you, you might, but even so, even with these fast chargers, you're, you're looking at at least a half an hour to charge up a, a, a full battery. In. Okay, but is, is, is this a problem for us, or is this a problem for other people who have not grown up knowing that you can put fuel in a five minute period of time and be able to go 300 miles, right? Right. I mean, so we, we have this, like, we're all built in thinking, okay, this is how it's gotta be. Mm. I've, got, I've gotta believe there's a generation of people who say, you know what, I'll stop and have a coffee and, and uh, maybe, you know, cool my heels and yeah, it's perfect, perfectly fine. I don't know any of those people. I don't either. <laughs> you know, Everybody's and, moving faster and faster and faster. Right, it, it's one thing if you're taking a nice vacation road trip mm -hmm. and it's like, yeah, we'll get a bite to eat and have a cup of coffee and the char car will charge. If you got a timetable, you're rocking. That's right. Yeah. And, you know. You just got to do better planning. <laughs> Come on, Lindsay. 
Okay. Planning. That's why I won't have one. Well, see, and it, I don't plan. So Lost in the Curve says, I'm pretty sure current assembly workers are telling their kids, do not count on following in my footsteps. You think that's happening, oh, Lindsay, sure. that uh, factory workers are telling their kids, don't get into this line of business? It depends on where you live. I think if you live in a Lordstown, which, you know, there was so much, you know, community around that plant because there's not a lot else out there, um, there might not be a lot of alternatives. It's mm -hmm. my view. Yeah, that's probably true. My, my guess is people who live in the plants uh, would welcome their kids to come into the plants. And, it's uh, a good job. I mean, you know, it's jobs with, with profit sharing and 401ks. And I mean, look at the signing bonus, 11 grand. Of course, that kind of offset the money they lost. Yeah. But nonetheless, it's, it's, it's gravy today when you got a gig economy and people working in these, you know, three and four jobs. Pretty, pretty stable. I, I, my own observation, it is teachers telling kids you don't want to go to work in the factory. It's their own peers saying, I don't want to go to work in a factory. I think their parents, if they work in a factory, are saying, yeah, this is a good job. Yeah. I don't think they would discourage them necessarily. Yeah. Okay, uh, George wrote in, Gary, to say, will the new contract at GM reduce the number of UAW employees? And have they positioned themselves to reduce UAW workers well, in the future? You laid that out perfectly, I thought, when you were talking about the 2,000 that retire. Right, but so it would... But I don't think that they're going to reduce the number of workers. <laughs> what I've said is as 2,000 vested retire, in progression move up by 2,000, the temps work, move up by 2,000, and 2,000 new temps get hired. So yeah, the total number pay. stays the yeah. same. Yeah. See, I think the number would go down. Because why would you, why would you, you know, because as you indicated earlier, there's overcapacity that exists. Therefore, why bulk that up, right? So you're going to say we need to reduce this number in order to get somewhere closer to capacity, yeah. at least in terms of manpower. I mean, you're still going to have bricks and mortar that you're going to like, oh, what are we going to do with this? Right, now? right, right. And uh, I mean, because you think about a big plant like Lordstown, which like it's gone, right? It's mm -hmm. getting nothing. And, you know, and I think about this you know, Detroit Hamtramck plant where they're talking about putting in the electric uh, pickup truck. And I'm just wondering... You know, how many jobs how many workers that really, does that take? How many, yeah. I mean, I just look at it from the point of view of, you know, even, even if, it's, if, if it's the same number of tasks that are needed to put this thing together, you know, what's the demand going to be? Exactly. Right. What's yeah. the you know, how many days are they going to be working? Like yeah. three days a week, maybe? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the thing that I wonder about a lot. Yeah, I, yeah. Garrett, I, I would agree with you that uh, in the future, there's not going to be as many jobs. But in this contract, the four years, the number's not going to change at all. That's what I'm saying. Okay, okay Michelle, MEC says, what exactly was the issue at Ford Chicago Assembly with all this rework of the new Explorer? Um, well, the way it was explained, all new vehicle, which went to rear wheel drive, they had other vehicles in the plant. They, it's an old plant. They tore it all up. The way it was described by Joe Heinrich is, we took on too much. You would have thought they kind of know that yeah. ahead of time. And thought. there was a lot of rework that had to be done. They shipped them down, uh, some vehicles down to Flat Rock and did some rework on those. So I think there were a lot of things that came together all at the same time. You know, the untold story about that whole redo is they called a bunch of retirees back in, people that had the incumbent uh, institutional knowledge uh, who never really planned to do this and they paid them really well. I've got friends that kind of uprooted and said, I'll see you in three months and went out, to, went out there just to work in that plant because they didn't have the knowledge to put it together fast. It had to be really fast. What are we going to do? Oh, get these guys. Uh, hello? <laughs> oh, you want me to go back to work? And that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. So they brought them into Chicago? Brought them into Chicago, yeah. A whole bunch of retirees. Yeah. So I guess the answer is we don't know the specific problems. There were a we, lot of we them. We know of things that caused the problem, yeah. Yeah. but we don't know what the specific problem was. Ford's been very quiet yeah. on that. Product problems, assembly problems. Do you know if it's fixed, Michelle? I, they claim that the worst of it's behind them. Yeah, I've got a friend who's got a transmission oil cooler leak. He said he's 300 and some in line on a new Explorer to get it fixed at the dealer. They all got notices. That's one little thing. Man. Yeah. Oil leaks. Yeah. Should yeah. not happen. Shouldn't happen. Not in this day. No, right. and that's such an important vehicle to Ford. High profit, high volume. Really is. 
Okay, uh, last one. South Carolina Osprey says community colleges normally I, train for local. I industry. was thinking about mm. that. Uh, and what's the one? Washtenaw uh, Community College, I yeah. think, has a really a great good training program. program. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, that was what I was referring to is we have an educational institution right. system right. that that's. But it's interesting, one important. of the things, I mean, and I remember Bosch in South Carolina, maybe you've been down there too, Lindsay, that, that they they partner with a community mm -hmm. college. So you actually have, yeah. you know, real right. on-the-job training experience in a real factory while you're getting your credits for your associate's degree. Didn't the Detroit Three do that at one point before these Taj Mahal uh, training centers? Went yeah, yeah, I yeah, seem to recall Usually, that. You, you know, if you are like skilled trades, mm -hmm. you did your training at the plant. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to go down to the Taj Mahal. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, and you think, I mean, here's a solution. You've got all these places. Do you, do you tear down a Lordstown or you turn part of it into some sort of training facility that, I don't know. No, I, I think uh, South Carolina Osprey's got it right. Mm -hmm. You do it at the local community college. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't have to spend a fortune to mm -hmm. go build buildings to do this. Do it yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, so that's the end of the questions. But, and, and we got one phone call here, and I think we'll bring that in to, to wrap up this show. But, Carmen, let's bring it in. Hi, John. Uh, this is Dale Leonard out of Cleveland, Ohio. I just want to wish you and Gary and the staff and crew at AutoLine a happy Halloween and your guests. And I get to celebrate another birthday tomorrow. Take care. Great show. All right. Happy birthday, happy Dale. Thanks. Thanks for that call. Really appreciate it. Okay, well, we'll wrap it up with this, but Michelle Krebs, Cox Automotive, right. always great to get your insights on everything. Lindsey Brook, SAE Engineering, always great to a, have you always here. Always a pleasure, thank you. Yeah, James. and Gary, we'll just keep on doing All this. All right, it sounds great. So happy Halloween, everyone. Happy Halloween. Oh, trick or treat. <laughs> Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. And by DIA MTS for advanced manufacturing machinery and lightweight components. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.